All right, guys, let's get into it. So today we're going to be doing the opening lab where I will be answering questions from uh, Patreon. This is something I've been doing every month for quite uh, some time now. And basically the way it works is once a month I put up a post on our Patreon page and our subscribers at the $15 tier, the opening lab tier or higher, um, get to pose opening questions that I then do a little bit of research on and I cover on this show. So we had a lot of good questions today that I'll be um, answering. And um, my rule for these shows is that, you know, if you're watching live on Twitch, it's also gonna go up on YouTube, hello YouTube. Um, you are allowed to ask, let's say, follow-up questions uh, that are, let's say, on the topic of the opening that we're discussing. Um, but I won't be able to just answer everyone's like opening questions. So if you asked about some opening that we're not even talking about, um, you know, there's a good chance I'll probably just going to skip over it. Uh, so hopefully that makes sense to everyone. And in the meantime, let's get into it with our first question, which comes from Ian who uh, asks questions pretty much every single time. And Ian is asking, what's a good line to meet the Grunfeld in Chess Dojo's view? Okay, so let's put the Grunfeld on the board. Of course, this is a very um, serious opening for d4 players to deal with. Of course, we have the King's Indian with bishop to g7, and we also have d5 here, which is known as the Grunfeld defense. So the point of the Grunfeld, for anyone you know just totally new to this opening or unfamiliar, is um, that black just immediately strikes back in the center and allows white to pretty much get a big pawn center with takes, takes, e4, and usually black even takes on c3 here, b takes c3, and then white gets this big pawn center and black's idea is to play bishop to g7 and attack it. Uh, attack the center with c5, castles, knight c6, queen a5, rook d8, bishop g4 if the knight comes out to f3, and, and this kind of thing. So Grunfeld is a really tough uh, opening to crack. I mean, I think it's pretty much uh, rock solid at um, at all levels. Um, but uh, there are definitely ways to um, for white to kind of pose problems. I think, you know, in general, white gets really fun positions against a Grunfeld, and there are many, many different lines that white can, can choose from based on, let's say, what kind of position you want, like the flavor and, and this kind of thing. For instance, if you want something like super aggressive, um, you can consider lines with like knight f3 here, black usually goes bishop to g7, um, and then h4. This line is totally playable and, and really sharp, white just tries to play h5, will sacrifice the exchange if needed and just play for the kingside attack. Um, there are also more positional lines like lines with bishop f4 and bishop g5 tend to be a bit more um, milder in, in action and can lead to kind of small edges for white. Um, but generally like the big main lines are considered to be generally starting with c takes d5, pushing for e4 and now choosing some kind of setup here. Um, so in the past, I've done many things from this position. I used to play knight f3 and uh, rook b1, which I think is one of the more um, aggressive ways or more ambitious ways of treating this position. The point of rook b1 is to put pressure on the b7 pawn, so you make it hard for black to play bishop g4. Instead, black has to make some move like b6, and uh, then, okay, it's like losing a tempo if the bishop comes out to g4 anyway. So this one I think is is pretty aggressive, although um, <clears throat> from a theoretical point of view, it should be said that black is basically okay all over the place. And if we play rook b1, <clears throat> excuse me, we have to be kind of ready for black to um, play these lines with takes, takes, and queen a5 check. And in this position, white has to be ready to sacrifice a pawn. So queen d2, not really anything special in the end game there for white. Usually white goes bishop d2, and then after queen takes a2 and castles, white does get really nice compensation for the pawn and can almost, um, you can definitely like guarantee a draw in many positions because you have this kind of repetition with rook a1, rook b1. Um, but if you want to play for advantage here, it is kind of a risky position because white has sacrificed the pawn. You get lots of compensation in terms of having more space and, and open lines and, and black has to figure out how they're developing. Black also owes us some time to uh, rescue the queen from a2. Um, but generally this is not going to be everyone's cup of tea because this is a 
very real pawn sacrifice. White is not winning the pawn back anytime soon. You're just playing for compensation. It's pretty theoretical. Um, if black knows their stuff, they're they're doing okay here. But um, yeah, this is one that's kind of considered pretty testing. Um, the Some other main lines here include bishop c4, um, let's say c5, and then putting the knight on e2. I would say in general, this is one of the most popular setups against the Grunfeld. It's very straightforward for white. You castle, you go queen to d2. Rooks can come somewhere to the center, like b1 or c1, and then other rook comes to d1. And white just tries to use the big center, maybe pushing f4 at some point um, to push on the king side. I think this is a very playable setup as well. The one that I've been um, enjoying myself for the last couple of years um, are the setups with putting the bishop on e3. And this is also the setup that um, Magnus chose in a number of games uh, not too long ago, I wanna say 2018, 2019. He won some very nice games against um, some Grunfeld players like Mamed Yarov. I think he beat Grischuk a couple times. Um, not sure if he tried this one against MVL or not, but basically he, he scored pretty well with the system and it made me really want to uh, investigate it deeper. Um, you can also start with bishop e3 here and then put the rook on c1. There are some subtle differences in terms of the, the move order, but I've always preferred to bring the knight out first and then play bishop to e3. Um, and yeah, the idea here is to develop this bishop to e2, white castles, queen can come out to d2, and then again, rooks come to the center, rook d1, rook c1, uh, for example. Um, I would say this is a very interesting way of playing against um, the Grunfeld. Uh, let's say black castles here, which I don't think is super accurate. A lot of times I get this kind of position. Um, let's say bishop e2, uh, knight c6, let's say we castle, and then black does something like take, take, and bishop g4. And this is just like a sample line, which I think kind of works out in white's favor. The thematic move to remember is this move uh, d5. And the point of this one is we're just trying to take space and, and kick black's knight off of the center. If black plays like knight a5 or something, then we, you know, we save the rook. We go rook b1 or rook c1. And I think white is doing really well with uh, advanced pawns, knight on a5, not really a good piece. And if black takes on a1, the point is we recapture the knight still has to move somewhere uh, like a5, and then white just immediately gets the exchange back with bishop h6. There are some lines where white just sacrifices the exchange for the dark square bishop and gets good play, but here white just immediately wins it back. Black has to do something like f6, and then let's say um, takes, takes, queen can come back out to d4. At some point, black will exchange this one. And this position I felt is generally quite quite nice for, for white. This is just a sample line, but it is a position that I've seen like a number of times because it's kind of very logical from, from uh, both sides. And I just like white space advantage. I like this bishop coming to like g4 and e6. And yeah, I think white is doing pretty well. Um, other variations here, for example, after d5, a lot of times black just takes on f3 and goes knight e5. In this case, white just backs up bishop to e2. You put the rook on b1, queen d2, second rook can come to c1. At some point, maybe white pushes f4, e5 tries to kick this knight. And this is kind of white's general plan with this big pawn center is you're just trying to get f4, e5 in. And if you can get these moves in and shut out black's bishop, your bishop comes to f3. Uh, you just get a massive space advantage and well that's how you try to break the Grunfeld. You use your space advantage and you try to uh, squeeze black to death. Um, so this is again just some sample lines but that's generally what we're uh, kind of playing for. There are of course other ways for black to play the position. Um, I think one detail I'll mention is if knight c6 here we can't really go d5 because of bishop takes c3 uh, check. So I, I think it's accurate here to start with rook c1. And the point is we defend this pawn and prepare to push d5. And even if black goes queen a5 here with the pin, we can go ahead and play d5 anyway. Um, if knight e5, let's say take, take, queen d2. This is an example of a position that is pretty typical, but I think is very nice for white. Um, we're going to play bishop e2, castles. One day we'll push c4 and f4. And again, just get this massive uh, pawn center moving. And I think that's pretty good for white. And the tactical line here is that if black takes this one on c3, then white takes with the rook, queen takes, bishop d2, and uh, white is going to be winning a second minor piece. So I think this position 
is, uh, is pretty nice for white, where you get two minor pieces for the rook, and you get this kind of fun middle game to, uh, to play. Uh, so of course, uh, objectively, black is doing fine. I think the main move here is queen a5, in terms of the, the theory, and white usually plays queen to d2. And when you play this line, you have to be ready to enter some kind of end game that looks like this. We have some options here you can take with the king or take with the bishop. And um, these end games, I would say, are quite holdable for black. But um, uh, I think it's not exactly, I mean, basically it's a challenge. White can put pressure here. And uh, I know actually David won a really nice Grunfeld end game that was similar to this uh, in Vegas. So it's not the easiest position for black to hold. Objectively, I think black is usually pretty solid here. But if you kind of know what you're doing, you, you know of ways of putting pressure from uh, white's point of view. Um, yeah, there are other moves here, like there's bishop d2 and knight d2, but I don't think they're as um, theoretically challenging. I've played knight d2 a couple of times, which I think is uh, kind of an interesting move. The point being queen takes c3, rook c1, and you win back the pawn. Um, so I think this one is totally reasonable, but okay, let's say queen d2 is kind of the main uh, main move white should be considering here. So if I had this position today, I would probably go for bishop e3. I guess that would be my official recommendation. But yeah, long story short, there's lots of stuff you can do against the Grunfeld. And uh, that's definitely not the only line where white is um, trying to fight for advantage. Uh, okay, so hopefully that makes sense, um, Ian. And I think actually I'm just going to finish up on that question and move on to the next one. Uh, okay, so next question is from Laurent, who says, uh, I have a question about a pawn structure that arises in the King's Indian. After the center is closed with d5, black plays f5, and white has two options. Yeah, reinforce with f3 by default, or play e takes f5 followed by f4. Right, I would like some pointers on when, which, when, wait, on <laughs> which scenario may work well for white, if ever. And I'll add some game references to help with the discussion, but I rely on your kid experience. Um, and then Laurent uh, actually included some games here, which I very much appreciated. So I can kind of see some examples of um, what he talks about. But generally, this is a pretty um, this is a pretty typical thing in the King's Indian. Uh, so let's talk about it a little bit. Um, and let's actually, I'm just going to start with looking at the one of the main positions in, in the classical King's Indian, where black goes knight c6, d5, knight e7. And in this kind of position, black is typically playing like knight d7 and f5 and going for the king side attack. And here, white kind of has a big choice. There's like b4, bishop e3, knight e1, um, knight d2, lots of lots of different moves. And honestly, I don't have a great... Uh, rule of thumb when it comes to dealing with f5. Um, I know that in this classical main line, let's say knight e1, knight d7, bishop e3, f5, white is pretty much exclusively playing f3 in this position, and then we get this typical line where black goes f4, g5, white pushes on the queen side, and um, black goes for h5, knight f6, knight g6, g4, and etc. Um, so, um, in this position, it's very uncommon for white to take on f5. Number one, knight takes f5 here is actually really not that bad. There is this rule in the King's Indian that says you have to always take gf, but I don't agree with it. There's many cases where knight takes f5 is <laughs> perfectly good. Um, this is one of them. Other cases is when, you know, black has a pawn on c5 and then can use this d4 square. And in those cases, I think it makes a lot of sense to take with the knight and put the knight on d4. But here, let's just say g takes f5 uh, and white plays something like f4. So this one is not as great um, because I feel like black's pieces are kind of, let's say, well placed to deal with uh, this push. Let's talk a little bit about why white tries to do this. What white is hoping for is for black to be compelled to advance e4 because then black structure gets fixed and white can kind of play uh, around it. And actually this knight on e1 is actually very well placed to just go to c2 and go to d4 and then even aim for this very nasty e6 square. This f5 pawn uh, becomes like a pretty pretty bad pawn, I would say, because it's just in the way of all of black's pieces. 
And black's light square bishop in this kind of structure often feels like a very, very passive piece. So white here gets a really nice blockade, puts the knight on d4, queen on d2, then can continue like king h1, rook g1, even play for g4. And um, yeah, basically white is just in, in total control uh, of the action. Um, one thing I'll say about this structure is that generally it's a lot, a lot more playable if black had already pushed um, c5. So if black could play c5 here and, and get away with it, in this position, I don't think it's possible because white just takes on passant and uh, it looks like um, d6 pawn is kind of hanging and position is just opening up. If black could play c5 and get this structure, then it's a much better version for black and I would say very playable because of course now white can't use this uh, d4 square and uh, black is fighting back. But without the pawn on c5, I would say generally this is, this is trouble. Um, a lot of Kings Indian players, I think, are at least familiar with that much and are generally going to understand that e4 is not something you want to do unless you have good reason to do it or your pawn is already on c5. And instead, what black usually does is they just keep the tension with a move like knight to g6. And the point here is that black is just going to be building up like queen e7, maybe knight f6 at some point, bishop d7, rook a8, king h8, and basically just keeping the tension and not letting it, not making it easy for white. I think in this concrete case, actually, black can also just take on f4 immediately. And although the structure looks weird for black, like black is leaving themselves with this isolated pawn, after knight g6, actually, it's uh, it's kind of white who's uncomfortable here because you don't want to give up the dark squared bishop. But if the bishop moves away somewhere, black is just pushing f4 and knight is coming to e5. And I think black is just taking over the king side. So this is why, let's say, in the classical main line, you very rarely see white taking on f5 and pushing f4. It's because black's pieces are just kind of very well placed to fight for some of these key squares, let's say e5 and, and f4. Um, so in these classical lines, you often don't see it. Knight d3 here is also a move. And then again, after f5, let's say takes, takes f4. Even here, black gets a tempo with e4. I would advise against doing this for the King's Indian player because then the knight just comes back knight e1 and then again tries to go for like knight c2, bishop e3, and white is certainly willing to give up some time in order to kind of achieve this nice setup. Um, instead, black just, I think, should go knight to g6 here, just keep the tension. And again, the point is to just slowly improve the position. And if white ever takes on e5, I think black has a choice here. You can definitely consider taking with the piece. I think taking with the pawn is also um, quite interesting. These pawns on the king side can be quite dangerous. Here, maybe this one is uh, solid as well, just hitting the c4 pawn and um, yeah, just trying to get everything out. Queen e7, bishop d7, rook a8. So in this position, I would say this is really not so great for white. Okay, with that, let's take a look at some of the games that Laurent uh, submitted where white is um, does take on f5, and maybe we can discover um, some differences. So a couple of games where actually I think it was quite favorable occur in the g3 variation. And um, Laurent includes this game by uh, Radek Watasek, a super strong Polish grandmaster. And um, we get this kind of thematic position from the Fianchetto variation. Here black goes f5. And if you know anything about the Fianchetto variation, the point is often that white does not want to get attacked on the king side. That's why they put the bishop on g2, because they don't want to deal with this attack. So in the Fianchetto variation, I think it is quite common for white to take on f5 uh, and then fix um, black structure. Here he plays h3, knight f6, and then he pushes f4. And the point is to kind of fix uh, the f5 pawn, not, black, not let black advance f4 uh, themselves. In here, we can see that black's pieces are not uh, nearly as well placed as in the other line. Nine on a5 is, of course, very misplaced for the king side attack. And nine on f6 is also would much rather be on g6. So maybe this is a pattern we can kind of uh, think about here, is that black just doesn't really have great um, uh, defenses here on, on the king side. Now, e4 was played in the game. I'm not sure if this move was forced. I think it, it doesn't really lead to a great position for black. But if e4 is not played, then white is just going to build up with rook a1 next. And it's just going to be actually hard for black to, to deal with this pressure. You know, you don't really want to put your queen on e7 lining up against the rook. It just feels like white's pieces are much better placed for um, this kind of central fight. 
Um, so in this game, black played e4, and then white immediately plays knight d1, which I think is kind of an instructive move because white wants to put the knight on this blockading square and one day trade off black's uh, strong dark squared bishop. I check with the engine, it thinks rook a1 is even stronger, which makes sense just to get the rook in first and then prepare to bring the knight to d1 and e3. And basically, uh, white is getting uh, a big advantage here. And I think we can kind of understand why, even though black has the pawn on c5, White is still just getting a really nice blockade and can one day even think about preparing this uh, g4 break. So this is one example where it really uh, works out for white. And I guess I should say in general, the point of taking on f5 and playing f4 is because you don't wanna give black this kind of easy attack on the king side with f4, you wanna kind of fix them in their tracks. And it definitely takes the game into a more, let's say, positional uh, territory where both sides are fighting in the center and whoever is better equipped to fight in the center will generally kind of prevail in the battle. Um, let's take a look at another example. There was another game uh, Laurent included uh, played by Ivanchuk, um, where he played this weird knight e2, knight c3 setup, I think with the idea of bringing the other knight to d2. And um, yeah, we get this kind of thing. And here black plays uh, knight h7, castles, and f5. And uh, here white takes, takes. Now one thing I've noticed when I've studied um, King's Indian positions is often when white is taking on f5, it's not always about playing f4, sometimes white just plays f3 here. And I think this is a move to keep in mind as well as another option. The point of this one is that it prevents black from being able to push e4 so easily because black will lose a pawn. And here if black pushes f4, well, because white already exchanged on f5, then white just drops back and gets this like beautiful e4 square for the knight. So this is a structure where black has to be really careful because white just gets all these light squares and the e4 square is a really nice outpost. Um, so this is also an option, but I think for black, you shouldn't push f4 or e4 too quickly. You should instead improve the position. Queen e7, b6, knight c5, bishop d7, rook a8, king h8, rook g8, etc. You should try to actually just keep these pawns fixed. It's similar um, to a situation with hanging pawns. If you guys are familiar with hanging pawns, usually it's just like two pawns in the center next to each other and neither of them really wants to move because as soon as you push one of these pawns, you kind of create weaknesses in your position. So generally black is trying to just stay solid here and white is also gonna try to stay solid and kind of build up. Um, in the game, Ivanchuk plays f4 and uh, I think black pushed b6 here. Knight f3 was played, knight c5. Now white takes, takes, queen d2. Black pushes f4, and then white takes on c5, which I think is pretty instructive, because generally you don't really want to uh, give up your dark squared bishop, but looking at this structure, white is just playing on the light squares, and black's dark squared bishop is just a completely uh, horrible piece. So white gets this diagonal, white gets the e4 square, of course c5 pawn is a big weakness, and positionally white was already just crushing here. So this didn't really work out for black. Instead, I think what black should have done was actually just take on f4, which again, kind of looks weird for black structure, but um, after something like bishop d7 and knight c5 and the knight coming to f6, I actually think black is uh, pretty much okay here. e6 square is under control. Black has the e4 square to use for their pieces. Queen e7, rook a8 again uh, can be the follow-up. And uh, yeah, I actually think black would have been doing okay here. Now, it doesn't mean black is better, it just means black is all right. And again, we get this kind of more strategic struggle where black structure looks funky, but black does have some nice squares for the pieces as well. So black has some kind of like dynamic compensation. Um, there's also another game Laurent submitted played by uh, Petrosian. And uh, here Petrosian chooses his own system, the Petrosian system, no surprise there. And we get this kind of position. Um, bishop g5, h6 here. And uh, in this game, black goes knight fd7, which I think is not quite right. Knight d2, f5, takes, takes. Again, white could have played f3 here. Um, instead chooses f4. And this one I think ends up um, actually quite quite nice for um, for white. Uh, here black does take on f4 and puts the knight on e5, rook e1, bishop d7. Um, but I think Petrosian just kind of slowly 
is able to put a lot of pressure here. And compared to the previous position we were looking at, Black's knight on e5 is just kind of under pressure. I think the knight is better placed on f6 or maybe even g6. Um, and yeah, eventually Petrosian kind of gets the, uh, the better of this one. That's kind of a nice maneuver. Bishop h5, kind of forcing the rook and then going back bishop d1 and putting the bishop here. So this is a very dynamic structure, but with both of white's rooks kind of lined up, it's one that's kind of difficult for black, because as soon as black pushes f4, white is just going to take on c5 and dominate uh, the light squares. So what should black have done in differently here? Well, I think this knight d7 move was a bit odd. Um, for me, usually I play b6 in this kind of position, so then on bishop takes c5, I can take back with the b pawn, and e5 pawn is very secure. Um, and then I think knight h7 is actually a better way of getting the knight out of the way so that the bishop here uh, is opened up on the f5 square. So for example, king h1, f5. Um, and here after takes, you know, black could even take with the bishop. I would say this is kind of like an undervalued way of playing the position, but um, honestly, it's not so bad. Like knight e4 takes, takes, knight f6. And uh, I mean, a lot of times it, it feels like white is just getting the e4 square, but I think black does get uh, quite a bit of pressure here. He can go queen d7, um, rook a8, and uh, yeah, eventually just like trade, put the queen on f5, and I think actually it's quite solid for black in, in many cases. So I don't think white really has um, uh, a serious advantage there. Maybe even no advantage whatsoever. So, okay, long story short, um, you generally don't want to take on f5 in the classical lines because it feels like Black's pieces are kind of well placed for uh, for those structures. But as we saw, when this knight is like on e5 or on c5, and actually not so close to the e5 square or the king side, um, then it actually does make sense for white in a lot of positions to take on f5 and, uh, and play f4. So kind of fighting back on the king side when black's pieces aren't so, um, so placed, uh, so well placed for that. Um, yeah, I only says I like, they like the Makagana variation of playing you know, where you play for h3, g4. Yeah, so when white plays the h3 lines and we get something like this, yeah, here the whole point of this variation is to be able to meet f5 with gf5 and then open up the g file and sometimes ef5 as well to open up this diagonal. This is a little bit different story because here white is not really following up with f4, but um, yeah, this is definitely a position where white's whole idea is to just take on f5 and open things up and fight on uh, the king side. Um, okay, Laurent, I hope that answers some questions. Again, I don't have like a hard and fast rule, you know, always take on f5 <laughs> in this kind of position. I think it's one of those things that's really like a case by case basis, um, but hopefully something in there was, uh, was useful. All right, with that, guys, let's move on to the next question. Okay, next question comes from Steve, Steve Slayton. Shout out to Steve. And uh, he says, hi, Kostya, trying to learn how to play better against the Karo. I prefer to get my pieces out, so the classic uh, is my preference. I've tried the advanced with poor results. Let's put the Karo con on the board. Any thoughts on how to fight for an advantage in the main line for bishop f5 as well as in the Tardikauer line? Or should I learn to play something other than uh, the classic? Thanks, and by the way, your help with the counter to the English attack really helped in getting much better results. Yeah, glad to hear it, Steve, glad to hear it. Um, okay, let's talk about the Karo Khan. So the classical line that Steve is referring to generally goes like this, takes, takes, and then here black has bishop f5. And then he mentions a Tardikauer line, which I actually am not familiar, but I assume it's this move knight d7 because this is pretty much the uh, only other, or maybe he means this move knight um, f6. Nowadays, there's actually three three ways that black can play this position. There's bishop f5, which is kind of like the classic main line. There's knight d7, which is um, quite solid, where black tries to go uh, knight f6. Here, of course, is very, very, very famous trap with queen e2, where if black goes knight f6, there's knight d6 uh, meet. And um, and there's also the modern lines with knight f6, where after knight takes f6, 
Black can either take EF, which is very solid, or um, GF. Okay, chess.com is telling me EF is the Tardikauer variation. Okay, so this one. Yeah, this one has become like all the rage uh, lately, and it's surprisingly solid. We used to think about these positions that they were not good for Black, because Black now has like double pawns and has four versus three on the king side that can never make a pass pawn in the end game, whereas White has a healthy majority here. So generally speaking, like the strategy for white in this kind of structure is to just trade off all the pieces and then win the king and pawn endgame. And so if you find yourself here, that's kind of a good strategy to, I think, to play for in the long run. Trade everything off, get into the king and pawn endgame. And if uh, you're able to do that, then you get to play this um, structure where you just get to make a pass pawn. Your opponent isn't able to make a pass pawn with these double pawns. And strategically, it's it's almost decisive. Um, but the modern outlook on this position is that, well, simply we're very far from an endgame and <laughs> black doesn't have to allow it. And black's position is actually uh, pretty solid here. Not that white can't fight for an edge, but just that black is, is not doing as worse, uh, as bad as we used to think. Um, there's also GF6, which I would say is pretty, uh, pretty adventurous. Um, so, okay, I'm not a huge expert in, in all these lines. I would say generally even the bishop f5 lines have long been considered to be uh, very, very solid for black. So what I would recommend against the, the caro, of course you can play this one, and my main suggestion here would just be the very simple, you know, study the games of players who play this variation and, and try to see what they're doing. Usually white's plan is to like first throw in h4, h6, and then let's say knight f3 uh, here, e6, h5, bishop h7, bishop d3. You know, the bishops come off and then white tries to play like bishop d2 and castle queen side and play for the king side attack. But I think in general, these positions are quite solid for black. So I think if you like it, you can definitely play it. It's very, very playable for white. But um, personally against the Karo and the line that I chose uh, in the e4 speed run was the exchange which I would actually suggest because I think this is a very simple approach and I feel like it's not that easy for black. So specifically, here's the setup that I would recommend. You take on d5 and you go bishop d3 and basically white's point is you're delaying knight f3 uh, for as long as possible. So usually black plays knight c6 here, we play c3, knight f6. Now if white were to play knight f3 in this position, you get pinned with bishop g4 I think black gets a comfortable version. So instead, a lot of players have been choosing this move, bishop f4. And the point is that you're just developing a piece. Now black has to move something. You take the e5 square under control, so black can't really hit you with um, with e5, anything like that. And now black has to make a choice. If they play, let's say, e6, well then their bishop is blocked in, you can now safely go knight f3. And I would say this is a structure where white can definitely fight for a long-term strategic advantage. The plan here is just to use this e5 square. So let's say like bishop e7, castles, castles, knight d2. White just wants to go rook e1, queen c2, or maybe queen c2 first and then bring the other rook to e1. You can double on the e file um, and then eventually just playing knight e5, knight f3, just using this e5 square and one day looking at the king side. You know, even like a rook lift, rook e3, rook g3, rook h3, definitely not out of the question. So if you can get some kind of structure like this, Black's plan is usually to play on the queen side. So the rook comes to c8 and black tries to push like b5 and b4. It's kind of slow, it's kind of hard to achieve. And once black plays b5, you know, you can play a3 as white to kind of slow them down. And essentially, I kind of like white's position more here. I just like this e5 square. I think white gets a really nice grip. So this is kind of one idea. If black plays g6 here, well, then the bishop is often going to g7, and I would say the bishop is simply uh, not as good here. Um, so I think at this point you can play knight f3, you can also like start with knight d2 for example, let's say bishop g7, knight gf3, and here okay, black gets to pin, but the difference is that when white plays h3, now the bishop doesn't have like bishop h5, bishop g6, like they would in the other line. So here the pin doesn't really make a lot of sense. Black has to like give up the bishop. I mean, most players don't do this at this point. They might even play something like bishop f5 here, but it kind of just shows the point of white's position is that you're just not really afraid of this pin anymore. You just kick the bishop and then bishop h5 g4 is of course unplayable for black. So if black gives up the light square bishop, then 
we're very happy with the two bishops. We still have this e5 square. And I would say black's bishop on g7 is not a good piece kind of biting on this granite. Um, so g6 is not really a perfect solution. I believe the main line here is for black to play bishop to g4 anyway. And here white's point is to go queen to b3 and just immediately uh, show black the problem with developing the bishop too early is that you hit this b7 pawn and from there we're going to go knight to d2 knight gf3 there's no more pin to worry about we can castle and again the plan is pretty much the same bring the rook to e1 one day maybe play h3 knight to e5 and uh, yeah i would say this position is quite uh flexible for white the speedrun videos aren't out on youtube yet and might not be out for a while um, but i would refer you to those when they come out because i I played a number of games from this position, kind of demonstrating some of White's plans. And yeah, I just think it's all about the structure here. You get this kind of nice structure, you get the e5 square, it's very simple, it's very straightforward. And I think that's um, that's what White should, uh, should do nowadays. Um, I'll also mention the two knight system is pretty interesting as well, but I won't go into it in too much detail. I just think this is also another interesting option for White where you can fight for an advantage. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, kind of a little bit more theoretical, not as clear cut as um, just going for the exchange variation with bishop d3. Um, okay, Leafy is asking, what's the best way to play against queen b3? Yeah, fair question. I, I, would, I don't want to leave you hanging on this one. Um, I think from Black's point of view, queen b6 is generally not considered uh, like such a great endgame. So white can start with knight d2, but eventually white will take, and then these double pawns, I think, are not so much fun for black. Um, rook b8, definitely a big no-no, where white puts the bishop on f4, so don't go for that one. And b6, also not good, because you kind of weaken this knight on c6, and after bishop b5, it, it's kind of annoying already. I don't know how bad this one is exactly, but you don't really want to um, weaken yourself like this. I think you already have to go back bishop d7, and then black's position is, uh, is just kind of passive here. Um, so I think the main move is to go queen to c8. I think either queen c8 or queen d7, both are uh, considered playable here. I'm not sure exactly what like the differences are. On queen d7, you know, you don't get hit with an eventual knight e5, but um, on queen c8, uh, you are kind of in the way of your own rook. So both of these moves have their minor drawbacks, but basically this is how I, I would say the top guys are uh, are playing this one. Um, and again, black's plan is to play e6, bishop e7, or bishop d6, and then one day go for queenside play. So obviously it's a solid line for black. I'm not definitely not claiming that white is winning or even has like a big advantage. I just think it's a very simple system to play that um, I think most Caro players won't be super, uh, super comfortable dealing with. Um, okay, Steve, hopefully that helps. And I look forward to hearing about your improved Caro results. <laughs> and yeah, uh, I will catch you uh, next time. Okay, let's go to the next question. Okay, next question is from Mitch, who was just in the chat. Shout out to Mitch. And um, he's asking, Hi, Kostya, I tried to pick up the semi-slav a few months back, but noticed that 80 to 90% of my games saw the exchange slav instead. That's surprising, 80 to 90. I, I mean, I knew the exchange slav is popular, but that's that seems high. Um, do you think this is a reflection of my approximate level, or is that pretty similar at higher levels as well? And do you have a suggestion on how to spice up the exchange Slav as black? Yeah, classic question, one of the toughest questions for Slav players, um, because the exchange Slav is kind of annoying for black to deal with, and it's one of the reasons I never really wanted to play the Slav myself, because then you would have to deal with this position, which is very similar to like an exchange French, where the structure is symmetrical, there's only one open file, and you know white is uh, white gets the first move right so it's like either white gets a small advantage or black equalizes but it basically feels like black is never having any uh, fun in the position. Um, now um, in terms of the popularity, I would say I would imagine that it's more popular at lower levels. Um, at higher levels, you know, from white's point of view, you are trying to fight for the advantage. The exchange slav is definitely like a very playable. Um, line for white and a lot of strong grandmasters uh, utilize it. But I would say that 
Um, in general, it's like not that easy for white, obviously, to get an advantage. It's considered to be one of the drier lines, one of the, the more solid lines, and not that aggressive, not that ambitious from white's point of view. So I think at higher levels, you start to see it less and less. Um, and at lower levels, it makes sense for players to choose this one because it's like a very simple line. It's kind of like the exchange caro. It's like white just gets a simple position and and just can kind of like play the structure without having to know a ton of theory, without having to uh, risk uh, being worse from the opening. Um, does that mean you would be less likely to see it over the board? Um, I'm not sure, honestly, I think it kind of probably just depends on the player. It is a very tempting option for, for white because it's like, again, pretty safe. Um, I would say as you go up, you're probably gonna see it less. Um, and if you're playing a higher rated player, then I would say it's less likely they're gonna choose it, right? Because they're gonna want something a little bit more ambitious. Unless they're like a specialist, unless they like play this line a lot and they really believe in it, then they're, they're just gonna play the line they believe in. Um, for example, Grandmaster uh, Perlstein, who's on this channel, he's played the exchange slot quite a bit and I think he, he has no problem playing it against lower rated players. Um, he likes this funky line with bishop to g5. Um, where he <laughs> kind of poses some problems and his point is that if knight f6 he's just going to take and kind of double the structure. So white can certainly play it in a very ambitious way and so there will be players that just kind of play it uh, every game. But generally yeah you will see it I think less as you start playing um, higher rated players. Okay now for the other question um, how do you avoid it or how do you spice it up? So there's a, a couple ways of doing this. Um, if we just take the exchange slot, so let's say we start with uh, this position, for example, knight c6, bishop f4, and you're trying to figure out what to do here. So like bishop f5, bishop g4, a6, these are all kind of like very solid lines. The one line I know of where you can get kind of a fun position is um, g6. And the point of this one is to take the game into kind of like Grunfeld territory. Um, now your bishop is not really gonna be good on g7, right? Because white just plays e3 and your bishop is again be, gonna be hitting kind of a brick wall. But it's a, not as much of, of a brick wall as when the pawn is on c3. And uh, the idea here, I believe, is for black to play um, an early knight to e4. So now if white like takes on e4, for example, and then tries to um, win this pawn, I forget the exact um, theory here, but I'm pretty sure this is uh, quite playable for black. I actually don't remember what black is supposed to do here. Maybe f5 uh, is okay. I'm not honestly not too sure. But usually what white does is they let you take on, on c3. So they play like bishop d3 here, black takes on c3, and then you get this kind of structure, let's say castles, castles. And this is kind of a dynamic structure that you can definitely um, try to, to play. If, if white doesn't go for like a c4 break, then you can try to put your knight on c4, like knight a5, b6, bishop comes out, rook c8. Then you try to use this square and put pressure on c3. Um, there's a well-known game I remember looking at between uh, Ivanchuk, I think, was white, and Kramnik was black, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, Kramnik ends up winning, I think, really instructive game. Um, they make the c4 trade at some point, and then they get this kind of Grunfeld structure, and then black is able to kind of win on the queen side using his two versus one. I remember actually, I only played the Slav like maybe, I don't know, three or four times in, in over the board tournaments. I remember I had one game uh, with the exchange Slav and I went for, for this option, and the game ended up drawn, but I mean, it was like a fighting game. It's not like it was just like I never had uh, any chances whatsoever. So this could be an option to look into if you are you know, definitely gonna be getting this position and you really um, don't wanna play some of the solid lines. The other thing you can do, which a lot of players do, is they use a queen's gambit declined move order like this. Um, or I would say even, even better would be to play uh, Nimzo move order. Um, actually, as Metal Black is uh, just saying in, in the chat. So you play knight of six here, c4, e6. If knight c3, well then you play the Nimzo Indian, no problems there, perfect opening. Everyone should know this one and be willing to play it. Um, and the point is, if white plays knight f3, you play d5, and if they play knight c3 here, then you get your exchange, or you get your semi-slav, but without ever allowing the exchange slav. Because of course, if white had taken here, this is not an exchange slav, this is an exchange queen's gambit declined. Uh, so you get your Carlsbad structure, 
um, but a good version where white has already committed the knight to f3 and doesn't have um, the famous Kasparov line with bishop d3 and knight e2, which I think is, is pretty pleasant for white. So this one is considered perfectly acceptable for black. You get your bishop out to f5 very quickly, and I think black uh, more or less equalizes, and you get a very um, solid position. Notice that this is actually kind of the reverse of the exchange Karo structure we just looked at. That's kind of a, a Carlsbad itself as well. Um, but yeah, most players here are just going to play knight c3, and then after c6, you get your semi-slav without ever allowing the exchange slav. The drawback to this one is that you do allow the Catalan, something that is not uh, just not a thing against the Slav. Um, so you would have to be ready to deal with this one. And personally, I'm not really sure if it's worth it to, to make this trade because I mean, the Catalan is like a very serious opening and uh, it's not a ton of fun for black. Like usually you have to defend a somewhat passive position or if you want something you know adventurous, you definitely have to know what you're doing and, and you are taking on a lot of risk. But that's kind of the the trade-off you're making. Either you allow the Catalan with this move order, of course the Nimzo, but I think the Nimzo is not a problem, so I wouldn't worry about that, or you allow the exchange Slav with, with this move order. So that's another thing you can do. Um, but the third and final thing I would suggest, and this is honestly, I would say the main way of solving your opening problems when you're not really sure uh, how to play something, you know, for a win with black or how to generate chances or, you know, just how to do it. What I would suggest is, um, taking this position after cd5, cd5. I know, Mitch, you have chess base, so this advice is hopefully useful for you. And uh, search the database and, and specifically uh, apply some filters. And, and so here are the filters that I like applying when I want to find like interesting options for black. Um, so number one, you want to find games where black won. That's not totally necessary, but it's nice to look at games where black wins. And um, I think you want to choose players that are uh, up to a certain level. Because if you look at like the, the top players, like the 27, 2800s, they're not trying to win with black in most cases, right? They're just trying to hold and, and be solid. So the players that you want to study are the players that are like 2600, 2650, 2500, really, really strong grandmasters that are playing in open tournaments, that are playing lower rated players that are definitely trying to draw them. And so you basically just want to study how these guys do it, right? Because there's lots of Slav players out there and the exchange Slav is not a new thing. And so every Slav player has to deal with this one. And the advice here is just to look at how the grandmasters uh, play this one, especially when they're playing against lower rated players. So in chess base, you can search for specific ratings. You can say you want, you know, neither player to be higher than 2600 or 2650, let's say. And um, you can also uh, apply a difference in the rating, meaning that it'll only show you games where there's a difference in rating according to what you set. So for example, like just before this, you know, I did a test, I looked for games from this position where there's a difference in rating of like 200 points. And then there was like a bunch of games, right, where, where black won um, and there was a 200 point difference in the rating between the players. Usually white was a lower rated player, but there was also, <laughs> there's also some games where white was the higher rated player and ends up losing. Probably not, I mean, maybe interesting to look at, but might not be the most uh, instructive, who knows. Um, and so, yeah, basically you just wanna find a bunch of games where a 2500 GM is outplaying a 2300 GM, study those games and you'll kind of learn, you know, how they, how they approach these positions and how they win. I mean, long story short, it's a very solid position, right? So the only way you're going to win this one against a decent player is kind of by like slowly outplaying them in some kind of long positional struggle, maybe winning some end game. Um, you can also set uh, the search to have games with only a certain number of moves, right? So maybe you only want to see games where black won in under 30 moves, you know, just to see like, well, how does black win this, you know, quickly? Like what could go wrong for white that white loses in, in under 30 moves? And okay, you just go through the games, you study them, and you know slowly you kind of pick up um, the, the the style and, and the tempo and, and what what are the typical things that players um, try to do. And generally, I really like this approach when you have any kind of um, difficult uh, issue in the opening or you're like facing a, a drawish line. So like for French players, I, I would I would suggest the exact same thing. Like if you're really concerned about the exchange French, which I don't think is a huge concern, but if you are then look up how the 2600 French GMs, you know, or the GMs that play the French defense, how they outplay their opponents, right, from this position, what kind of things um, they're, 
uh, they're doing. But ultimately, you know, again, it's going to be very quiet positions and it's going to be a quiet positional struggle. So your yeah, it's going to be hard to just generate, you know, dynamic play from the opening. But the Slav defense, it's one of the most solid openings in chess, right? It's it's not an opening that's designed to be uh, super, you know, dynamic. So it's kind of um, kind of comes with the territory. And last thing I'll say is yeah, just don't worry about it. You know, like, let's say you get some game, someone plays exchange Slav. And, you know, if it's solid, you make a draw like that's nah, just one draw, you know, out of uh, you know, out of a couple of games, it's like next game you'll get white and you'll crush them, right? So it's like if you make some draws with black, uh, even against lower rated players, I don't think it's really the end of the world. Um, but I would also say, you know, at this level, 2000, 2200, it's not like you're just not going to get any chances uh, in these games. I think the players you're playing will definitely give you chances in the long run. Um, okay. Uh, so hopefully that was useful and yeah, let's go to the last question. So last question here is kind of a more uh, general one from uh, Mr. Always Double Check. And uh, Always Double Check is asking, okay, in this video, Gata talks about why he first started playing the London. There's a YouTube link. Uh, the part I'm wondering about runs from 30 seconds to two minutes, if I'm understanding correctly. He is saying he often got worse positions with white and started playing the London because he was looking to play black defenses with colors reversed. In my own games at the amateur level, I play d4, c4 with white and e4, e5 and d4, d5 with black. I too am often dissatisfied with the positions I get with white and I'm much happier with black. What are your thoughts about Gata's take on the London and how can I construct my white repertoire so I'm happier with the positions I get. Okay, really, really interesting question. Um, I, I checked out the video linked and indeed that is kind of what Ghana mentions. Essentially, he's talking about this uh, period of time back in the 80s actually, it was like late 80s, 1986, where um, with, uh, with Black, what he mentioned was that he was playing this variation against the, uh, the Ready, which is essentially uh, reverse London. So he was making, he was playing this kind of setup against uh, the ready and, and having good results. And with white, he was essentially losing uh, some games because according to Gata, he didn't know the theory and yeah, his, you know, just getting sharp positions where he, I guess, uh, you know, is getting outplayed or is not sure what he's doing. And he decided, well, like if I like that setup as black and he's also, you know, uh, he's been also been playing the Slav for quite some time. Um, then why not play this with, with white and, and play the London system with basically the same setup but with uh, an extra tempo. And it is quite a logical thing um, to do. Um, and if you wanted to do something uh, similar, but well, number one, I mean, you can definitely play the London. I mean, I, I think it's a very controversial opening, but the real problem with the London, uh, as I made a video about it, is the mindset, right? If you're playing the London or any opening, where you're just making the same moves without really thinking about what the opponent is doing and just kind of playing on autopilot, then that's not good for your chess. You're just gonna get the same positions over and over again. You're gonna lose to stronger players, you're gonna beat weaker players, and you're just gonna kind of stay uh, where you're at. That said, there you can play the London in an ambitious way where you're trying out different structures and different setups. Like in the video that um, is mentioned, Gata shows a game where he plays London and he ends up castling queenside. So like if you're willing to experiment with different setups within the London and, and try uh, to play it in different ways, then it's 100% uh, uh, a fighting uh, opening and you can absolutely uh, play it, especially if you enjoy the positions um, that you're getting. Um, and again, the same goes for any kind of system opening, the Kali, the Tori, uh, the close Sicilian. There are correct ways of playing the opening and there are incorrect ways of playing the opening. And if you're just playing it on autopilot, that's probably not good for your overall chess development. Okay, so um, the question is, how do I how do I get better positions with white? Well, one thing, you know, given that you're playing e4, e5 as black and, and d4, d5, uh, I'm not sure if you're going for the QGD or the Slav here or what. One thing you can do as white, as just an experiment, is you can play a3. And then just pretend you're playing black with this move inserted. And it's honestly not the craziest thing uh, in the world. I mean, some GMs, you know, will play this in Blitz. I don't think there are any, um, I don't think there are many GMs playing this in like, you know, classical over the board games. 
<laughs> but it is something you can at least experiment with. Um, because the point is essentially you're, it's as if you're playing black and you get this free move a6, which is useful in almost every opening. You know, for example, like imagine you get to play this position with a6 inserted and you don't have to worry about the Rui Lopez anymore. <laughs> All right. So if you're really interested in just playing your black repertoire as white, I would say this is the way to do it. Start with a3 and then pretend you're playing black, right? So d5, you go d4. E5, you go E4, and you just make the, the same moves. Now, it doesn't mean you're going to get an advantage with white. For sure, black will equalize in all these lines, but maybe you'll feel a little bit more comfortable. And here, A3 is also, uh, again, very useful to in pretty much any opening to, to cover this um, B4 square, or from black's point of view, the B5 square, right? Like in D4, D5 in the Slav position, you know, A6 is a move. So much so that sometimes like a6 is a move here, right? Where black just spends the tempo to play a6, right? Or here also a6 is a move. So you get this move for free. It's totally legit or in the queen's gambit declined. Um, a6 is not like the most useful move, but a6 is a move here that Magnus has played actually a number of times. So like if you're willing to play this position with black, it's certainly not bad with white with uh, a tempo up. It doesn't mean you're, you're gonna get an advantage, it just means it could be an interesting position for you to play. So that would be what I recommend if you really wanna go this route and uh, and just play your black openings. And it seems like there's a few players in the chat that are, uh, yeah, not so happy with their white openings, but <laughs> do like their uh, black approaches. Um, another thing to do, you know, if you're a Sicilian player, you can play the English and just pretend like you're playing the dragon, but with an extra tempo. Or, you know, you can play like e3, knight c3, knight f3 here. Uh, that's totally fine. Uh, but ultimately, I would say that this is kind of like a stopgap approach. Because one day you're going to... You're going to get tired of it, you know? And, and for Gata, him, you know, it's not like he played the London his whole career. I mean, there was a time where he was playing you know, E4 main lines and D4 main lines. So it's not like he just played the London and then he he was done. And eventually he did switch over to just playing E4 and just going for the super sharp, you know, open Sicilians and Rui Lopez's and, and all that stuff. Um, and so what I would say is like in the long run, what I would suggest is to think about what kind of player you want to be, right? So if you want to just be someone that's playing, you know, like weird opening systems for your whole career, I mean, that's fine. But like, if you think about some of the top players and there might be a player that you really admire, I would say it might be worth to put in, start putting in the work now and just start slowly building out your repertoire. So ultimately my suggestion is like, if you wanna just play A3 and experiment, that's totally fine. But I would suggest choosing a top player that you really like, you like how they play with white. You know, you can choose uh, Magnus, you can choose Aronian. Um, so I'm like pretty much a D4, C4 player for the most part. I've always liked the games of Levon Aronian and Vladimir Kramnik. I think they play some really interesting chess. Um, Mamed Yarov is another one that plays D4, C4 in like really uh, aggressive ways. Um, Lok Van Whaley, uh, just throwing a random name out there, just a strong grandmaster, you know, it was 26, 2700. Um, excellent D4, C4 player. Choose a player you like and, and just try to model your approach after them. Or switch to E4, you know, if you've always wanted to play E4 and, and never had the guts. I mean, what do you have to lose, right? It's like, it, it might take a while to learn these positions. It might take several years before you feel comfortable. But chess is a game where you should be thinking about kind of like the long-term approach. You know, what kind of player do you want to be in two years' time, in four years' time, right? If you're looking back at yourself now, like in three years, how do you want to have spent that three years time? Now, again, you can totally make an argument to say like, let me just play A3 and I'll study tactics for the next three years. I'll study end games. I'll study middle games. I'll just become a stronger player. And then one day you'll start studying openings. And I think that's totally fine. Um, or you can just start today trying to get more experience in the positions that you actually um, want to, to play. Now, maybe you're a very strategic player. You don't want to um, you're, you don't want to like play all these like aggressive lines where you're um, fighting, uh, you know, always playing for the attack and taking on a lot of risk. In that case, I would say the English is a very interesting opening where it's definitely more positional. It's no less ambitious than D4 and C4, it just takes the game into uh, different territory. 
and um, yeah, you can learn some lines uh, with C4 and G3 and, and study some games, you know, of uh, Ulf Anderson, Yasser Sarawan, Karpov, Magnus, Aronian. Um, these are all guys who played the English for at, at some point in their careers and, and did pretty well with it, you know, with, with some um, really uh, decent, decent results. So what I would say is, I guess, ultimately, don't look at the opening as something, you know, you have like you're just learning something for one game or one tournament. Think about the openings as what you want to study and and improve in, in the long run, right? Like if you can study any opening for six months and become a beast at it, you know, what would that opening be? I think that's the question you want to ask. And um, once you choose that opening, that kind of like inspires you, whether it's to play E4 and super aggressive, whether it's to play D4 and, and play aggressively from here or to kind of play in a more positional way, you can play E4 in a positional way as well. Here, I would suggest studying the games of Magnus, who can be quite strategic, and uh, of course, Mickey Adams, who is also, um, I would say, very, very solid, very positional uh, E4 player. Really instructive player to study, in my opinion, Michael Adams from, from England. Um, there are lots of amazing players to, to choose from and, and follow their approach. So ultimately, that would be my advice in terms of how to actually one day get to a position where you are happier with your overall white uh, white repertoire. Uh, okay, hopefully that was uh, useful and I look forward to seeing uh, what you come up with. Let me know what you choose. You know, <laughs> I'm actually really curious um, what you end up deciding, but that's my advice. Choose a player, model your approach after theirs. Just take a look at their games, play all the same lines they do. Of course, it's gonna be a struggle at first, and there's lots of opening traps you might fall into, but but that's chess. You know, like you you learn from experience, and you know you lose some games online. It, it doesn't really um, doesn't really matter uh, ultimately, um, because uh, it's all about the long term, right? So you lose some games now, but in the future you'll be a much uh, much better player for it. Okay, guys. Well, that's gonna wrap it up for uh, the opening lab here. Um, yeah, like I mentioned, I mainly just answer the questions that are submitted through uh, Patreon, and I'm okay with uh, follow-up questions just on any of the specific openings that we uh, discussed. Um, but uh, yeah, I'd encourage everyone to, uh, well, check out our Patreon page, and if you would like to submit questions for the future, um, you can do that, as well as getting access to uh, a lot of previous content that is exclusive to Patreon. I did a bunch of articles and videos for uh, for the, the page uh, a while back that you now would get access to. Um, and again, you get to ask uh, questions for the future. Um, so yeah, that's gonna wrap it up for this month's opening uh, lab. Okay, there's one question I'll answer. What is a white version of the Karo and Slav? I mean, I don't know, these are defenses, right? When we're playing white, it's like we're trying to fight for the advantage and we're playing when we're playing black, we're trying to get an equal game. So it's not really, there's not really a one-to-one, -one, um, uh, let's say one-to-one, -one, what am I trying to say? One-to-one -one equivalent, right? There's like, yeah, the Kali system, right? Where we're playing like D4, E3, C3. <laughs> like you can just play like the reverse of whatever you're doing. But I don't know, I think this is ultimately kind of a timid approach and you're probably gonna wanna switch in the future anyway, away from it. So I'm not sure if there's a lot of benefit to just playing like a super, super timid, solid opening if you're just gonna, you're just gonna be in the same position right in six months where you're like, man, I'm tired of this, I wanna play something more aggressive and you're still gonna be starting from scratch. So why not start from scratch today rather than in you know a year from now? <laughs> that's, that's my advice. Um, okay, guys, that's going to wrap it up for uh, the stream. I think I'm going to close things up. Thanks to everyone for uh, following and for a couple of the subs at the top of the show. Much appreciated. Um, let's see. I'm going to be streaming again tomorrow. I think I'll be doing uh, a one-on-one -on -one lesson. And, um, yeah, I don't know what the plans are for the rest of... Our, our streamers, David might be around, he mentioned at some point, maybe tonight, who knows? Uh, Jesse will probably be back at some point as well. And uh, yeah, oh, and I'll be doing the US Chess School uh, lecture on Friday, so stay tuned for that. That'll be pretty exciting also. Um, alrighty. 
yeah, that's going to wrap it up. Let me find someone uh, to raid and we will close out the show. All right, y'all have a good one. Take care.